Uh, Gift to Live is an expression I use to describe um, my philosophy in life, and uh, Gift to Live has given me back my ability to dream. Um, it has taken me from selfish pursuits to a life lived trying to help other people. And I would never have presumed to have the audacity to believe that I could make a difference in the world until the age of 40. And I was given the opportunity to help people in Southern Africa from the gift of my neighbor's daughter, a young girl. And by just following that door that it opened into the unknown, it li literally has changed my life and given me opportunities in music and adventure that I could never have imagined that I would get a second chance at the age of 40 to, to live these, these dreams. And up until that time, I was following the reality path that was laid out before me. As so many people saying to me, you should take a practical route to life. I remember my, my dad saying to me, you should do computers. That's where the future is. But, you know, we were in high school and we were working with typewriters. I didn't even know what a computer was. So I was like, okay, computer sounds good. And I remember going into a computer college and within one day I was already behind. Within a week I was completely lost. And I quickly figured out computers wasn't the answer. I fell into different jobs trying to pursue this reality path, this constrictive path, this box that people like to put you in that closes out the light of your dreams. I call it a euphoria cocoon that we sometimes find ourselves sliding into. But as we get older, we're supposed to follow this streamlined path to success. We're supposed to decide at an early age. They talk about it by grade nine, you should already know what you're doing. But you come into school grade nine, you're 14, and you're completely mesmerized by the whole experience. So how are you supposed to know what you want to do? And then by grade 10, you've got to start to make these decisions and find these pathways. And if you mention dreams, people are like, that's, that's nice. It's really, that's a nice dream, but, you know, you need to do something that's going to get you a job, a career. So you find that euphoria coming under a cocoon, and when you want to express this joy in your life and this passion for dreams, it's held down. And being freed up like that has put me into situations that I could never imagine myself being into and, and given me courage to try things that I would never have thought I could try. Finding myself in a small plane flying thousands of miles up north to work with our First Nations people. I don't like small planes. And I discovered how much I don't like small planes when I actually got into one. And it's the size of this picture of a minivan with wings. Right? And I didn't know how it worked. You know, we got out of the WestJet plane and we walked up the runway to this tiny plane that was taking us up north. And you get in there and then the, the pilot turns around to you and it's like someone in a minivan turning around to you and telling you to buckle up your seatbelt and he's giving you all the safety things. Here's the fire extinguisher. If we go down, put your hand between your legs. I'm thinking, if we go down, we're down. It doesn't matter what I do, right? <laughs> And then I realized that the guy talking to me is wearing overalls and he was the same guy loading the luggage into the plane five minutes before. And then I get really scared and I'm like, what is going on? And we take off and that plane goes so fast. It's unbelievable. Felt like it was in a rocket. But then you're up in the air and you're still alive. So you calm down a little bit. And then I lean over to the person beside me and she goes, we only got three more stops and we're there. I'm like, stops? Is this a bus? What do you mean stops? It was, oh yeah, there's three more stops before we get there. So I got scared all over, and then we were flying into Fort Hope, and I look out the window, and I'm looking down at the runway, and it's dirt. It's dirt. How can you land a plane on dirt? <laughs> you know? So I look over, and I said, holy the runway's dirt. 
She just laughs. But it was the best landing ever. It was like butter. Those pirates, uh, pilots are amazing. Pirates. That would have been really scary. <laughs> but in taking these adventures and meeting people, and this is the irony, the, the desolation in the far north and in Africa, it's overwhelming. But it's oddly freeing to immerse yourself in other people's lives and to try and offer a little bit of hope to them. It gives you the freedom to live your own dreams, to know that you have to honor the sacrifices of the people that you've met and to honor the difficult lives that they are leading. And that's what Give to Live has given to me. Black mold, mice scurrying over lunch bags, cracks in the walls begging the winter wind that curl around the feet of shivering kids. This is a description of a portable in Attawapiskan. Canada's dirty little secret. Far too many of our Aboriginal people live in third world conditions. This is a picture of a room in Martin Falls, a reserve that I visited. It's over 1,500 kilometers north of here. On this mattress you see black stains along the edge. It's black mold. Those are these children sleeping at night. You see the walls eroding from the wet conditions, the roofs leak, the homes are overcrowded. Because of the Indian Act, First Nations people aren't allowed to own their own homes. They're built for them by the government. And while they're waiting for their house to be built, if it will be built, they bunk up together with friends and relatives. So it's not uncommon to have 20 people living in a house built for six. And if there's no room in the homes, they make their own. This is a picture of a tent-like structure found in Atahuapiscat, where the temperature would reach minus 50. And the eyes of the world weren't cast on our First Nations people until the chief of Atahuapiscat declared a state of emergency in 2011, alerting the Red Cross to the plight of our First Nations people. And then the eyes of the world were cast upon this in shock and horror at how these people lived. And the land is desolate and beautiful, but cloaked in desperation. This is a place called Webekwe that I've been to five times. It's a typical street on a reserve. It's not paved. The whole houses all look the same. Many are in a state of disrepair. It's incredibly expensive to fly building materials up to these reserves. A flight on WestJet is $140 to Thunder Bay. From Thunder Bay to Webekwe, it's close to five, just to get there. Three peppers are eleven nineteen. We pay about four here. Orange juice, eleven fifty nine. Three to four times the cost of what we pay, particularly for healthy food. So many of the children that I work with, you see them have open sores on their face from vitamin C deficiency. Obesity is epidemic on the reserve, and diabetes is out of control because junk food is cheaper. They can't afford healthy food. There's only one store on the reserve. And if the planes don't come in and the ice road is informed, the supplies go down and the prices go up, so the people have to be prepared for these things. So they still embrace traditional hunting and fishing methods. Here we see a picture of them smoking fish over a fire for protein during the long, cold winter months. Every word that you speak out, every letter that you send makes a difference. And the time is now to speak out for our First Nations. The fastest growing youth population in Canada and in the world needs our help. And our lives begin to end the day that we become silent about things that matter. This is the lessons of Martin Luther King, whose voice and words still resonate many years later with us about how we can make a difference in the world, how we can unite. And it's not enough to think these things that are talked about, but we need to act upon these things because the divide gets bigger as 8% of the world's population owns 80% of the world's material wealth. And we hear about it all the time, like 
Corporations are greedy and that they haves and haves nots are farther and farther apart. But we sit idly by in a vain hope and do nothing about it. And we need to speak out. We need to raise our voice. Not just for the people in the First Nations or around the world, but for our own future. And I've seen these things. This is a picture of a girl from Swaziland that I met. Swaziland, life expectancy of 29. In Canada, it's 85. These shoes were a treasure to this girl. And in our society, they would have been cast away long ago for two reasons. They're dirty and worn, and they don't fit. But in this hard ground that we saw the children running around, most of them bare feet with thorns. Very few had shoes. And we gave them dollar store flip-flops, and they ran around like it was the greatest gift they'd ever received. Their faces beaming with pure joy at this simple gift. And these are the homes they live in that are made of mud and sticks that make our houses look like palatial mansions. And this is their school. In the middle of nowhere, the home is far away, and the children do walk miles to get to the school. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to ask you, if you could, just for a minute, just close your eyes for me. And I want you to visualize the last classroom that you were in. And I want you to see and be in this classroom again. To see all the technology and all the things that you have to achieve your educational dreams. The computers, the smart boards, your pencils and pens, calculators. Be in the room and feel what it's like. And then look at a room, a classroom in Swaziland. The temperature sometimes dips to zero in the winter, and the children, 37 of them, sit on this carpet in rapt attention as the teacher delivers the same lessons, the times tables that we grow up with, but also gives them the greatest thing that they can give any child is hope and the belief that they have a chance. But the reality is that very few African children even make it to high school. It's a paradise beyond their imagination. Many of them had to pay to go to school, and the decisions faced by their parents are often which child do we send? And that's their reality in many cases. And I learned these things from my next door neighbor's daughter, Paige Pedler, who at the age of six saw a television program on children in Africa. And on the program, there's a six year old girl raising a brother and sister by herself because both of her parents had passed away from HIV. And Paige decided to do something about it. And that night she wrote a book, Who Will Cuddle Them When They Sleep? And it said it was $4 per child on the program for antiretroviral medicine. So she said, I'll get this book and I'll sell it. One book at a time, one child at a time, and I'll make a difference. And it was published. The title coming from that night when she asked her mom, what happens to these children when they go to bed at night? The ones that don't have parents. And her mother had to tell her the truth that they go to sleep alone. And there was no one to cuddle them. So she named the book this so that she would never forget. And her dream was to build an orphanage. But she's already changed lives in so many ways. There are over 200 orphaned children here from Tanzania. And I call them the lucky ones because they have clothes. They have shelter. In Nairobi there are 500,000 orphaned children. One city. One city. They are indeed lucky, and the food that you see here was all bought for, paid for by Paige's dream, by her book. And she's raised $15,000 to help these children. And here she is, reading from her book. Adults, kids, and even babies sometimes live alone in Africa because of AIDS. If we all try, we can help them. They really, really, really need our help. It makes me cry when I think about them because their moms and dads are dying and the babies and kids are dying too. Kids my age have to take care of their little brothers and sisters because they are orphans and all the adults are sick. Who will save them from the goblins in the dark? Who will make them food to eat? Who will hear them crying? Do you know who? Nobody. Did you know that it only takes four dollars to save a baby? We need to help the babies and kids because they are sad, scared, lonely, and sick. 
Most of the kids will die all alone if we don't save them. I want to save a lot of babies. Can you help? Thank you. In 2005, I went to South Africa, Cape Town, South Africa, into the townships to film a uh, video. And it was that belief and faith that took me there because I'd never even done a video before or been to South Africa to do a project like this, but I just believed that it would happen. And the more people we told about it down there, the more it started to happen. But it was shocking to me to see how people lived in South Africa, in Cape Town, one of the wealthiest cities of the world. This is how people live when they come to the city chasing a dream. They're often forced to settle for this while they wait for the dream to happen, and it doesn't happen all the time. This is a boy I met in Swansea Land, and we used to jam and play guitar and sing and play soccer together. I took pictures of him because I was captivated by his movements and the spirit that seemed to emanate and radiate from his body. Such a pure spirit of life that came from this man who lived in the bush and had no home. But it was a humbling lesson to me that your spirit and the power that you have doesn't come from what you own, it comes from the strength and magnitude of your heart. But the children's eyes were always there as a constant reminder with the depth of pain and the history that they had in their eyes to remind you of the realities of their situation. That we would spend one day feeding 200 children a piece of bread and a quarter slice of an orange. And you could see the hunger in their eyes, but they waited with dignity and bow each time we gave them a piece of bread and a piece of orange. And it was all I could do to keep the tears out of my eyes because I didn't want them to see it. Because they were grateful, they were dignified, and I didn't want to show that. That it was breaking my heart. Thank you very much. Um, when I say give to live to people, I truly believe that you spend every day of your life reaching out and giving to others that you will never have a bad day in your life. No matter what the burdens or pressures and you reach out with that power that you have inside of you, you can make a difference. And the thing is, it's just belief. Have the audacity to think that you can make a difference. And I learned this from a six-year-old girl and from the children in Africa, and from the children of the First Nations, whose eyes brim with hope and sparkle through the mire of desolation. And I can never turn my back on that. Thank you very much.